at this afternoon's sold out webinar on uh, the EU budget recovery. We have a very distinguished audience in attendance and I would like to particularly welcome our MEPs who have registered for today's event, members of the Oireachtas and the many ambassadors for today's collaborative webinar between the European Commission representation in Ireland and EM Ireland talking about the multi-annual financial framework. So our topic for today's discussion is entitled an EU budget for recovery and it is focused on the Commission's new budget proposals for the future EU budget and the recovery plan for Europe Next Generation EU. I'm delighted to be moderating our event today and would like to warmly congratulate the European Commission representation in Ireland for having the foresight and initiative for today's important and timely topic and webinar. Indeed, as an independent not-for-profit voluntary membership organisation, we in European Movement Ireland have been striving tirelessly for over 65 years to develop the connection between Ireland and Europe. To that end, today's webinar is a perfect example of our mission to ensure the robust and fact-based debate on Irish EU affairs. So we're delighted to be involved in this important collaboration with the European Commission for this afternoon's webinar. As we all know, the Commission's budget proposal was announced on May the 27th, containing a standard seven-year EU budget for the 2021 to 2027 period, designed to facilitate and regulate the EU's annual budget and a special recovery fund for, to aid Europe's recovery from the COVID pandemic. Composed of grants and loans, the Commission's proposed recovery fund is composed of two thirds given as grants of 500 billion and one third as loans, 250 billion under next generation EU, with the MFF then composed of 1.1 trillion euro. One issue of importance is that of ensuring that the recovery framework is compatible with continued investment in European initiatives in the long term, as well as ensuring a complete recovery. Initiatives such as the transition to renewable energy and digital transformation are central to the European Commission's budget proposal, as are initiatives aimed at ensuring the social fabric of our union, such as cohesion programmes. Indeed, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said, the recovery plan turns the immense challenges we face into an opportunity, not only by supporting the recovery, but also by investing in our future. The European Green Deal and digitalization will boost both jobs and growth, the resilience of our societies and the health of our environment. This is Europe's moment. Our willingness to act must live up to the challenges we are all facing. Here to tell us about all of this today and much more, I'm delighted to be joined by, I believe, from an equally sunny Brussels, our keynote speaker for this afternoon, the Director for Revenue and Multi-Annual Financial Framework in the European Commission's Director General for Budget, Mr. Andreas Schwartz. Welcome, Andreas. Andreas has a very distinguished career, and it's fair to say he has considerable experience with all matters relating to the EU budget and a history with the MFF, having previously served as the deputy head of the private offices of two commissioners, Mr. Janis Lewandowski and Ms. Kristalina Gorgieva. Andreas was responsible for negotiations on the 2014 to 2020 MFF and is working on the 2021 to 27, 2027 MFF, in addition to advising the Commissioner on economic and financial matters, trade, internal market, research and innovation. Prior to assuming his current role, Mr. Schwartz previously served as head of unit of the multi-annual financial framework in DG Budget. So a very busy portfolio, um, Andreas, and a distinguished career and much experience. So very much looking forward to your presentation here today. Lastly, I want to offer a couple of housekeeping words in terms of this afternoon's webinar. So our running order, um, which will see Mr. Schwartz deliver his opening re remarks for around 15 minutes or so. This will then be followed by a question and answer session. So I'd invite you, if you wish, to submit your questions please do so via the Q&A function on the Zoom platform, which is now live. And for those of you active on the Twitter machine, please feel free to get involved in the conversation, tagging in EU Ireland, EM Ireland, and the hashtag Next Generation EU. I want to thank you for joining us at I'm sure will be a compelling and informative webinar. 
And with that, I will hand over to Brussels to Mr. Schwartz and, and invite him to deliver his keynote address. Andreas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Noel, for this very kind uh, introduction. And uh, welcome to all of you, ministers, uh, members of uh, parliament, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends and colleagues. It's a real pleasure for me to uh, speak to you today. And I, I apologize for the slight technical delay. I also have to say I am, in a sense, only connected by a telephone. So I'm blind, if you want. So I would need the help of the colleagues from the permanent representation to guide me through this uh, session. Now, <clears throat> the proposal that we have made uh, last week is indeed historic. And perhaps it is historic in three ways. First of all, the size, and that's the most obvious part of it, of the package is unprecedented, and I will get to that in a, in a second. The construction, the legal construction is unprecedented, basically by proposing to allow the union to borrow for spending that has never been done in the past. And thirdly, the structure and those elements on which we will spend on is also unprecedented. So it is truly a historic uh, moment. Now, I have some slides. I hope that colleagues can, can see that. And I would kindly ask uh, Ryan to put on slide one. Okay, I assume that this is being done. Now, um, when you when we conceived this package and discussed it, of course, there was a clear macroeconomic uh, downturn. We have GDP levels that are way below to what we had expected a couple of months ago. It is in 2020, 7.4 percentage points lower than we had uh, expected. And still in 2021, we expect it to be 6.1% uh, lower. So we have a, a huge fall in, in, in GDP. And I think you are very much aware. And, and this GDP fall, of course, uh, affects countries very differently. Now, uh, if you could turn to slide number two. Now, the impact uh, of, uh, of this uh, can be seen very much in the balance sheet uh, of many uh, companies. We need, at least for quite a number of sectors and companies, repair equities. Uh, we es we uh, estimate that 35 to 50 percent of firms with more than 20 employees experience financing shortfalls by the end of 2020. We think there is an investment gap of at least 1.5 trillion in 2020 and 2021 caused by this uh, crisis. And of course, it is not just Europe that is uh, affected by it, but also our, our neighborhood. If we could now turn to slide number three. Now, <clears throat> when we did our economic analysis of the fallout of the COVID uh, crisis, we see particularly three areas that we need to address. The first one is obviously the, the single market. We see that member states have very different capacity to react to this crisis. Some member states have deeper pockets than others. And we need to be mindful that we are not basically bringing about a situation where some member states um, because of these deeper pockets, get through this crisis very, very well, whereas other in other economic structures are going to be destroyed. So that is one important aspect uh, of and, and, and foundation, if you want, of the proposals that we have done. Second one, there are of course huge interlinkages between EU economies, supply chains. Uh, if they are interrupted, if you look at car production, for example, um, that has an effect on the whole on the whole sector. So we need to make sure that supply chains and complex supply chains can be can be maintained. And thirdly, we think that we should also learn from the lesson from 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis, because we see. Uh, that those economies have been particularly vulnerable to the crisis 
who perhaps had a stronger need for structural reforms uh, uh, along the way. And we think that what is ahead of us should not just be an investment package, but a reform and investment package. And that to that uh, I come in a, in a second. Now, our uh, proposal of uh, this so-called next generation EU package, so this temporary and extraordinary package of 750 billion, is worth around 5.25% of EU GDP and it should have a permanent positive effect on EU27 economic activity. It could uh, lift real GDP levels by around 1.75 in 2021 and 2022, and an additional 2 million jobs could be created by 2022. So, if we please could turn to slide number four. This slide shows you uh, a bit the overall st uh, structure and of course the amounts that that you see here are quite uh, staggering and and let me let me go through them you are already aware that the european council and the eurogroup agreed in april to a package of uh, 540 billion this is the short term unemployment uh, reinsurance scheme it is esm pandemic crisis support and it is an EIB guarantee fund for workers and businesses. We think we need to add this uh, to this package. These are mainly uh, credit lines and, and financial instruments. Now to this, last week we have um, added two elements. One element was already there before, but we have slightly uh, changed it. So the first element is the next generation EU, temporary reinforcement of 750 uh, billion euros to address the immediate needs uh, of, the, of the crisis and crisis repair. And of course, the multi-annual financial framework for 2021 to 2027 of 1,100 billion. Uh, this last element uh, was already on the table since May 2018. Two years of negotiations have gone uh, into this. There was a European Council in, in February this year that unfortunately failed. Uh, but uh, in, let's say, those who are familiar with these kind of negotiations, it is quite common that the first round of an MFF negotiation fails. But the the proposal that we have now done very much is based on the state of negotiations that we left in February with some, let's say, slight uh, adjustments, but we felt we needed to build on uh, two years of negotiations and did not want to reinvent the, the wheel. So the real novelty of the package is the next generation EU part, so the 750 billion part. Now, if we could turn to the next slide, please. Um, this is um, a picture that describes the overall construction uh, of this. Now, if you see the, the blue box where it says reinforced uh, MFF, MFF means multi-annual financial framework. So these are all the programs that we have in the EU budget, be it cohesion policy, common agricultural policy, research and innovation, and so on. From this, member states benefit the private sectors and other stakeholders. This is the standard if you want uh, MFF and the standard construction. Now, I have to I apologize, but I have to get a little bit technical for you to, to understand it and explain it. We have in the multi-annual financial framework, a payment ceiling. So an upper spending limit, if you want, it's like a credit card ceiling until we can uh, spend. But above this, we have the so-called own resources ceiling. This is a ceiling that is enshrined in a quasi constitutional act, the own resources decision that allows us uh, to uh, that gives us the absolute highest level of spending we can have. Now, the own resources ceiling uh, for the moment is at 1.2% of the gross national income of member states, and we have proposed it to go to 2% of the, 
of gross national income of member states. Now, the difference between the payment ceiling and the own resources ceiling is the so-called headroom. That's the budgetary space that we can use for borrowing operations. And this is exactly what we have now done to finance this package. We will we propose that the union borrows money from the markets and this money will then be channeled into the different uh, programs. And I will say about those, those programs in a, in a second. So the, the union borrows, but of course has to, to repay uh, at a later stage. Now this is very important. In the past, we have never done this. This is a, a real novelty and of course also not uncontroversial, if I may say. But in the current circumstances where member states' finances are severely strained, we felt this was the only real way how to finance a package of this, of this size. So this is the, the construction of this next generation EU package in terms of financing. And if we turn to the next slide, um, you see the different programs that we want to support from this, uh, from this fund. And they're divided in three uh, categories. Supporting member states to recover, kickstarting the economy and helping private investment, and learning the, the lessons from the crisis. Now for the first part, the biggest chunk, and I have an extra slide at the end, is the recovery and resilience facility. So I will go into that facility in, in a second. Then we have recovery assistance for cohesion and territories of Europe. This you could consider as a top up for cohesion policy. So that is around 50 billion financed from the next generation EU. Then we foresee a reinforcement of rural development of some 15 billion euros and a reinforced just transition mechanism, just transition mechanism is a program that helps regions to transition from a carbon intensive economy to a low carbon economy. And here we have added 30 billion uh, euros. So that's the first part. Um, the second part is kickstarting the economy and helping private uh, investment. Now, some of you may be familiar with the so-called InvestEU program. This is a guarantee program that helps um, businesses. It provides via National Promotional Bank and the European Investment Bank funding to companies, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, innovative companies and so on. So this we have strengthened and we have added two components. One is a solvency support instrument that helps what I referred to before uh, on the equity side of, uh, of, of balance sheets of companies, so to allow the possibili possibilities to take equity investments. This is a, a big innovation in, in our financing uh, offer, if you want. And secondly, or if you want thirdly, a strategic investment facility. You are aware that a lot of discussion is out there that certain products uh, of critical importance, if you think of medicines, for example, but also in other sectors, are not produced anymore in Europe. And here there is a push to bring or to, to provide incentives for some of the production here to take place in, in Europe. So this facility will finance these kind of, uh, of programs. Now turning to the third category, learning from the lessons of the crisis. Of course, when the COVID uh, crisis hit us, it was apparent that we have very little means at EU level to address these kind of uh, issues. So we have created now a new health program. We have also a program of civil protection that's called RescEU. Also this has been strengthened as well as um, uh, programs like research innovation and also the external action because it is not just we in the EU who are affected by this crisis but also our neighbors. 
Now, coming to my last slide, uh, number number seven. This is the main, if you want, the bulk of where the financing goes, the so-called European Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility. It has a budget of 560 billion euros. So you see a, a huge chunk of, the, uh, of this temporary package with 310 billion for grants and 250 billion for loans. It is to be used for public sector investments and reforms, including in digital and green transitions. It is again grants and loans and member states can decide how they mix this uh, optimally. Uh, and it is in theory available for all member states. I mean, the grants part is available for all member states. Every member state has an allocation. The loan part may be interesting for member states who have higher borrowing costs than the European Union. So it may only be some member states that will be interested um, by this. Good, perhaps to, to conclude um, and say one word, one last word if you want on, on the timeline. It is of course important now to try to conclude negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework and this recovery package as quickly as possible. Um, the Commission has said in its uh, communication that an agreement at the level of the Council should be found by July. So the next weeks will be extremely intensive in terms of communicating about this package, about explaining this package to Member States, the European Parliament, uh, to, to other stakeholders uh, and of course um, try to, to convince everyone that this package is the best way forward for Europe uh, at the current juncture. I think in the interest of time I leave it uh, at this and I'm obviously available for any question that you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. And although we couldn't uh, see you, we certainly could hear you and uh, your insights on your very wide ranging presentation, I think very amply uh, outlined both the scale and the ambition and also both the challenges and the opportunities facing the European Union in terms of the uh, next seven years and the funding framework.